Hey, everybody, I stepped away to go get a cup of coffee. I'm encouraging you to do that, too. So um, I am here to chat. Frozen and no audio. Lisa Strange. Well, Lisa Strange in Taylor, Taylor County, if you can hear me now. Barbara would like to know, what is one thing you've learned recently? Oh, man. What is one thing you have learned recently about plants? Can anyone think of something that they've learned recently? Hi, Joyce from Charlotte. I'm trying to think of something I've learned recently about plants. Oh. Somebody learned, Lena, uh, Lana and Dwight Arnold learned that bird of paradise and bananas are related. Yeah, they are. They're all in the same order, Zingiberales. And then the families come off of that, um, Lena. Um, also, Heliconia is in that group and Traveler's Palm. So yeah, that's a nice group, but you can kind of look at the leaves and say, okay, I figured that out, but the flowers itself are quite different. Oh, um, Margaret Stewart, that grapefruit and uh, grapefruit is a happy accident of a mutation. Yeah, it is a wonderful happy accident. I love grapefruit. It's okay for vegetable plants to look wilted during the day. Right, Yvonne, it is. Sometimes they just tuck her out and that has a lot to do with respiration and photosynthesis and the plants sort of shutting that those processes down um, so they're not drawing water so they don't overheat. It's kind of a neat way. Uh, Kathy says Simpson stopper seeds take a long time to germinate. I have not practiced that myself, but I am interested about that. I'm going to check that out, Kathy. Thank you. Carol John says not to mix common names with botanical names. Yeah, that's true. Lisa said just yesterday at Ag Expo, learn planting longleaf pines, little liners need to be planted half above the ground. Oh, interesting. Lisa, are you going to be planting a lot of, uh, of uh, pines? Maybe you are. Mark Stewart says, Beware of master gardeners bearing plants that you have to have in your landscape. You know, Margaret, I think that if someone shows up with a big bag of plants and says, here, you can have these and take all you want from my yard, it's usually an invasive plant. That happened to me with uh, Clarodendron and the invasive Boston fern. Sean has no audio. So Sean would not hear me say that they probably need to unmute their audio on their computer. Joyce learned that there are great palm varieties to choose from besides the same handful you see over and over again. It's a chance to make your landscape a bit more unique and lovely. Yeah, good job, Joyce, that is true. Uh, Lauren said, can you repeat how to get the GIFs and emojis? Okay, so if you wanna put a GIF in the chat box, open the chat bubble up here, um, up at the top, and then when you, uh, where it says type a new message at the bottom, um, you would click and then you see the uh, smiley face or the GIF um, below where your chat box bar is. Good job, Melissa. Really good job. I like your choice there. Wilma has audio but cannot see anything. Um, you may want to check your settings um or your screen Wilma um Barbara says if you are lacking the audio click the three dots up at the top next to the emoji up at the top and when you click those you can pull down and see um device settings and you may be able to get to your audio that way Three dots, select device settings and deselect mic, adjust the volume. 
Mark Conley said he's lived in Florida for five years. I've learned that I need a sweater when the temperature goes below 60. That's of course correct, Mark, because it's freezing. But you can still wear flip flops below 60 if you have a sweater or a hoodie on. Colin is getting double sound. So Colin, maybe go up into the settings and adjust your mic as well. Device settings and speakers and headphones. Check that. Leonard Daskovitz, I'm sorry I left an S out of your name last night. I will figure it out though. I'm sure your certificate is correct. If it's not, um, check that. Barbara says, if you have double sound and echo, you may have two devices, your camera plus desktop going at the same time. Jamie didn't realize that the separate, the chat is on a separate screen from the main screen. She left and came back and the chat screen came back too. Maybe someone has a different experience than me though. Thank you, Barbara Stites, for saying that. It's 9.50. Hi, Michelle. <clears throat> not seeing an emoji button below the chat bar yeah, where it says type a new message uh, in your chat bar once you click on the bubble up at the top click on the bubble up at the top and then you'll see the chat bar open either on a new page or on the same page and below where it says type a new message you see a smiley face a gif and a sticker and i'm going to put a sticker in right now Good morning, Deborah. How do I unmute myself so I can hear audio? Well, you should be able to hear my voice, Karen. So that might be on your own soundbar of your computer. Good job, Melissa. Nice sticker. Okay, FYI, I didn't have the chat option until I connected using the app. Mm, okay. Vicki Nicewanger, you can type in your conference link. It's short enough. And remember that I typed it in in that last email that's not embedded in the PDF. So the last email you got from me this morning, you actually have a link in the body of the email that you can click. Thank you, Cedar Key, for checking in. Uh, yes, Donna, MGs can open the presentations without downloading Teams. Yes, they can click directly on that link and get the presentation. Um, Lauren says she doesn't see what I'm seeing. She doesn't see any ads for GIFs either. I don't see anything on the bottom. It's all the bottom for me. OK, it must just be the setting for that on that device. Barbara says the chat bubble uh, might hide until you move your cursor to the upper or lower levels of the screen. You may need to activate it. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Bill from Walton County. I'm glad you're here.
Julie Norsworthy, I see you listed as a participant on my screen. So that's good. Evan Anderson had to reconnect to see the chat option. For some reason, it wasn't there the first time I connected. OK, give that a try. If you're having trouble with that, you may want to sign out and sign back in. You too. Good morning. On the screen, you're supposed to be seeing now the Welcome Master Gardener Volunteer Advanced Training Conference screen with the giant magnolia with flower parts flying, flying in the petal and maybe some participants around you. Uh, Mac users may need to download. Um, I'm not sure, Donna. Um, good morning, Mary Reed. Thank you, Ann, for letting me know that. Paulette. You are listed as a guest. I don't know why, um, but you have full rights that everybody else has. Donna got it to work. Never mind. OK, Dwight. Has something to show us. Um, I think. What if I slide that over there? Yes, we can see that, Wendy. So that's from Dwayne, who's one of our IT help people. Right. Um, and it's got all of the options that a, a participant should be seeing. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Brenda Daly, if we don't have Microsoft Teams, does it make us a guest? Um, I'm not sure, but yes. you are. Yes, that is true. That is the case. But you are you are a guest of Teams because we are um, kind of just trying this platform for the first time. Um, let me see if I can do that. So these are some other functions of Teams that you can do. Here you view chat and raise hands. Here you mute microphone and camera. Here you can enlarge the gallery. Here you can choose a virtual background. Here you can engage the um, live captions and then off to the other side or laser pointer and pen and hide slide notes. So I'm going to leave that up for a few minutes. But step away for a second. OK. We're getting close to getting started. So Elaine and Ron. Hi, Elaine, first off. Um, Elaine, go up to the top. She wants to see the screenshot with the tiny uh, without a tiny picture. Go up to the three dots at the top and then click gallery or large gallery. 
or a full screen and see if one of those works for you. Thank you, Barbara, for bringing this out. As we prepare for these fabulous presenters, which they are going to be amazing, please remember the chat bubble would be the best topic related comments. The, moder the moderator will relay your questions. Okay, D Hackett, if the dots are at the bottom, then um, go ahead and click on the bottom. Carol Johns, you have a black bar that says Emily is recording. I think you should have a X where you can uh, undo that. OK. All right, we're getting close to 10 o'clock and we will start very soon. And we have over 650 people registered for this virtual Master Gardener volunteer conference. We are very excited that you all are here and um, attempting and doing this new platform with us for teams. When we went over the 500 persons mark, we had to move over to the Teams platform because we wanted to have it set up as a meeting so we could all interact and see one another's faces, et cetera. Um, so it's important to us that we make that connection. We didn't want it just to be a webinar where we didn't have that. Um, so I'm really glad that you are all here today and that we are going to have, um, have this conference unite together. I can see that we have people from all the way from the Keys, uh, from Key West to Pensacola, from Jacksonville to Naples, crisscrossing the whole state. So I am just thrilled that you are here and I am thrilled that you are investing in your education as a Master Gardener volunteer. And we are going to um, go ahead and get started. This morning, um, we're going to have some welcoming remarks. Then we're going to do the recap of our awards from last night. Um, we're going to quickly go over the look of teams, and I think you all have come in a little bit early and you have some experience with that already. Then I will introduce our keynote speaker, Abra Lee, or Abra Lee, I have to say it correctly. So the first thing I want to say to you is thank you. I want to say thank you to the conference committee. B.J. Jarvis, Ann Yaslanis, Lisa Sanderson, Katie McCormick, Ava Pavone, Larry Williams, Barbara Edmonds, and Emily Eubanks, and Emily Marois. Um, I also have to say a big shout out to all of our moderators and all of our organizers. Thank you all for helping to moderate these sessions and thank you for organizing these sessions. So for those of you, as you go into your sessions, um, you will be able to ask questions in the chat box um, towards the end of the session. So we want to make sure that the chat box is used for questions and not necessarily commenting or chatting uh, with your neighbor and saying, hi, Mary Ellen, your hibiscus looks great. So we're just going to keep that to specific questions. And I also want to say um, thank you to the team here at the um, Center for Land Use and Efficiency, our CLUE team, uh, most specifically to Emily Eubanks for going above and beyond for getting us on this team platform and getting it all organized so this will go smoothly. Also, I want to say thank you to Madeline Iyer and Jen Sykes and Caitlin Rob Price for helping us out with the conference as well. So much appreciation and I would be remiss if I didn't say thanks to Emma Cannon or I'm sorry, Emma Barrett, who went ahead and packaged up all of your aprons and coolers that went to your county offices, your conference goodies. If you have not yet received your conference goodies and you had registered before October 1, they will be coming. Um, they, we had to do a second wave of ordering to accommodate everyone. So uh, those will be coming to your extension office. Your extension agent has an Excel sheet that we sent them so they know 
who ordered before October 1 or on October 1 and were able to get those. So those will be coming um, to your office within the next month. Okay, I do wanna remind you too that the bookstore will be coming in at lunch. Uh, Sheila and Sarah have books to highlight for you. Um, and they also have shirts, um, t uh, hats, t-shirts with the Master Gardener and IFAS swag. And I am wearing a new IFAS shirt today. I bought it special for the conference. So this one is available too. It's kind of a dress shirt and three quarter sleeves. So um, last night we had the Awards of Excellence, and the recap is the Beautification Award was won by Pinellas County for the Folly Farm Project. Manatee County won the Communications Award for their Expanded Garden Bench. The Demonstration Garden Award was won by Hernando County for their work at their Extension Office Demonstration Gardens. The Diversity and Inclusion Award was won by Hernando County for their work with the ARC in their local area. Educational materials was won by Polk County for their garden journal. And the newsletter award was won by Duval County for their excellent newsletter called Roots and Shoots. All of the applicants were amazing and the voting was very close on all of these. Also the team award was won by Sumter County for their journal revised. Their, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Award was won by Broward County for their Art in the Garden project. The Personal Communication was won by Karen Hollerman from Manatee County. And the Outstanding Master Gardener Volunteer was won by Kim Tecca of Bay County. And Bay County also won the 4-H and Youth Award. So congratulations to all of our winners. The Legacy Award, which is a grant that goes out to the counties to help support local projects. Um, we had, um, I think, five or six applicants for this this year. Seven, actually, now that I think about it. And our winners were Franklin County, which is uh, up in Apalachicola, um, for new technical equipment to bring lectures to the people uh, in Franklin and Apalachicola. And the other $1,500 award was uh, awarded to Manatee County for their outdoor classroom at the Manatee County Extension Office. Last night, I was remiss in honoring our Flagler County uh, service winners. Uh, so we had Joy Hudson uh, got her tenure, Jean Florio got her tenure, Barbara Knipsis got 15 years, Ingrid Elmorsi 15 years, Catherine Wash 15 years, and Maureen Caulfield got her 20 years. So congratulations to Flagler County, and I'm sorry you were left out last night, but we made up for it this morning. All right, so this is your agenda that you all have been sent now three times, and I will send it again tomorrow morning also. Um, and here you will see that we have the Horticulture Contest Qualtrics form. We've already had over 50 people um, participate in the survey. And what will happen is you enter your name and your county, and then you go into a series of questions about the plants. It's kind of a matching. And um, the top four scores from your county will be combined to give it a, um, give the team award for the county. So we'll, on Thursday morning, around the lunchtime at lunch, we will announce the top county team and the top high individual. So we will let you know that. So how are we gonna navigate this team uh, agenda today? So I want you to make sure you know where this agenda is um, and um, you will <clears throat> click on, as, after you hear Abra Lee present today, you will click away and then you'll come and click the next session you want to see, which for me is Palms for Florida. So then I'm going to come in here and click this. If for some reason this is not live in your PDF, just go ahead and type it into your browser because it's a short enough URL that you should be able to do that or um, just try to um, click on it uh, or copy and paste it and put it into your browser. 
All right, thank you for your um, time and your energy and for your patience as we navigate this. I'm just so thrilled that you all can be with us today and think about it, y'all. We are just growing so much as we go through these virtual and digital times. Think about the amazing amount of technology growth that you have had. So I have to say thank you so much for all that you do in your counties. Um, and as Master Gardeners, you've really kept up with your education and you've done an amazing job in investing in yourself and making yourself an even better Master Gardener. So when you go out to the public and our clientele, you will be the best that you can be because we are known for our research-based, unbiased information and the most up-to-date information. And that's what we're getting today is this up-to-date information, not just for our own edification, but to take this information and share it back to the people of Florida to hopefully improve their lives as well. Okay. So I think we've kind of run through this. This is what it looks like on my page, but um, this is your emoji button. This is where you access the chat. And if you click these three dots right here, that takes you to the drop down menu where you can go to your settings and try to troubleshoot your viewing as well as your audio. So without too much further ado, I would like to welcome our very special guest, uh, Abra Lee. She is a national speaker, writer, and founder of Conquer the Soil. Um, she is known for celebrating the history and art and culture of horticulture. She puts the, the culture in horticulture. She has worked as a municipal arborist. She has worked as an extension agent at UGA. She has been a landscape manager and overseer uh, for large airports, huge airports, and I'm sure she'll talk about that. She's a graduate of Auburn University and alumna of Longwood Garden Society of Fellows, uh, and a, it's a global network of public horticulture professionals. So she is well-lettered and well-known and well-respected in the horticulture world. And I have to say that one of the benefits of being virtual is that we have have Abra right here with us in our in our presence uh, and it's just to have that accessibility is wonderful. So today she's going to be sharing with us the Great American Road Trip and we are just thrilled to have you Abra. Welcome to the Florida Master Gardener Volunteer Conference for 2021 and we're so happy that you were the one kicking us off. Thank you so much for having me today. And we are going to go on and get started on our road trip today and hope you have your snacks, your drinks, your sweater and scarf if you're in it. Uh, well, for me in Atlanta this morning <laughs> and I'm going to go on and share. And Wendy, just say in my ear if I've if, when you can see my screen. OK. okay. Can you see it? Not yet. I have to. OK, I've stopped share. Go ahead and try again. OK, let me. Um... Yay. OK, you can see it. All right. All right. We are ready for this road trip, everybody. We are about to uh, take a bus, a bunch of cars. We're going to go across America. We're going to come back to Florida, go across America again and come back. So here we go with um, the Great American Garden Road Trip. Now, the first stop we're going to make is to Cascade, Montana. And some of y'all have seen this picture before. It's a pretty iconic picture. And I wanted to start things off with a bang, literally. And this is a woman named Mary Fields, more popularly known as Stagecoach Mary. And she is legit one of the Black pioneers of the Wild West. This is a woman that was born into slavery in Tennessee and makes her way out to the state of Montana and is exactly what her nickname is. She is a stagecoach driver. She delivers the mail. She fights off bandits. She fights off the weather. She fights off thieves. This is a woman that can make a shot within uh, 30 paces. She eats in the um, hotels there for free. She drinks in the saloons for free. She is beloved in the Cascade, Montana community, and she is one of us. She is a gardener. And one of the things that she is super beloved or, or is beloved to her in Cascade is the Cascade Montana baseball team. 
And anytime they have a game, Stagecoach Mary is there front and center. Here she is with the team taking a picture, uh, cheering them on. And at the games, for every player, she makes a buttonhole bouquet from her garden, from her own floral garden. And she makes these five huge um, oversized bouquets for people who hit home runs at the um, baseball games. And I just want to show you a picture of her. This isn't the greatest picture ever, but that is her sitting there in her flower garden. And I wanted to start off with a person like Stagecoach Mary, because so many people in horticulture aren't do, are just doing it for the love of it. They are curating these flower gardens and these flower farms or pass along plants or whatever you want to call it, just out of love for people. So she is absolutely an icon. And yes, you did need your sweater and scarf in uh, Cascade, Montana today, but we're going to go to a little a place next that actually it's not much warmer there for our next uh, trip. Well, no, maybe it is. This is we're now in Kansas City, Missouri. And the woman that you see here is a woman named Bessie May Weaver. She is considered the first black florist west of the Mississippi. This is a woman who was a laundress and she um, was washing clothes, saves up her money and starts propagating geranium plants. So she has her own plants to grow and sell and starts a fruit and floral company and is also selling potted plants. And then most famously uh, launches the, the, the florist um, school that she has there in Kansas City. And she also is a woman who is actively involved in civic work. And in 19, in the late 19 teens, I want to say it's around 1920, but a little bit before that, she is giving a speech at to what is called uh, the Negro Business League. They're having a meeting up in Boston and people like Booker T. Washington are there. And she talks about what flowers and horticulture have done for her life and how when the shopkeeper closes their doors at night, their sales cease. But essentially to her, Mother Nature is working with her in her endeavors even while she is asleep. So she is making money in her sleep, y'all, off these plants. And look at her in this picture, looking like a bag of new money out there in Kansas City. Bessie Weaver, the icon, the first black florist west of the Mississippi. And remember her picture, because we might see her again today. You never know. Now, Duval County represent. Y'all are in the house. I know some of y'all recognize the woman that you see here. This is Blanche King Hurston, Jacksonville, Florida's finest. Blanche King Hurston is born into one of the pioneer black families in Jacksonville. And Jacksonville, as we know, is a place at one time had the largest black population in the United States and also the wealthiest. And this is around the turn of the 20th century. Now, J Blanche Hurston is what I consider a legacy child of horticulture. And I say that because her father, who you see on the left, this is Ed King, Edward King, was an estate gardener for the Meg sisters. Here he is with Gerda Meg. Um, and you can see the, um, the, the, the plants behind him in his head, uh, almost like a, an arbor that's behind him there. So Ed King is a top tier uh, estate gardener in Jacksonville, Florida. And what he also does for his daughter, uh, Blanche King Hurston, is that he runs her farm, her flower farm and nursery. This is a woman that sells plants and also runs a floral business. And she opens her shop in 1927, and it is the first uh, shop of that type to open in Jacksonville, Florida, and she is wildly successful. Here you see Blanche King Hurston on the right with her chauffeur, who is also her godson, a gentleman named Herbert Austin. Now, I keep saying the name Hurston, Jacksonville, y'all know what time it is. Blanche King Hurston is the sister-in-law of Zora Neale Hurston, the Harlem Renaissance writer, icon, anthropologist, um, just Florida icon, if you will. And she is married to the older brother um, of, of Zora Neale Hurston, and his name is John Hurston, also a very successful businessman in his own right. And what's amazing about uh, Zora Neale Hurston is that she also, uh, through her work in anthropology, does a lot of uh, work writing in describing black vernacular gardens in the early 1900s at a time when a lot of people were being very dismissive and very insulting of these black vernacular landscapes. 
So I want to show you a picture of the Hurston home and business. And this is um, the Hurston's home. Zora Neale Hurston lives off and on with them from her teenage years. She lives there in her 20s, 30s. She comes back. She is beloved by Blanche and John Hurston. And this is her floral shop that is down there in the right corner. And in the back, you can kind of see a, one level is a little bit higher. That's because they needed an expansion. Blanche Hurston was so busy selling her plants, working this flower farm, that she had to expand the business, her floral shop, the Evergreen Avenue shop, which was right next door to her home. But something happens in 2013. And some of y'all notice the shop is bought, the plot of land is bought by developers and the shop is destroyed. And this is what it looks like today. This is just a picture from Google Earth. But when I was down in Jacksonville in July and earlier this year, I was down there twice. I went by there and it's still just an empty lot. And this is just 2013, y'all. So when we don't know these stories, we aren't able to protect the gems of our community. How amazing would that have been to still have this flower shop that Blanche Hurston owned? And this is a place that had wooden floors in it. This is a place that when she opened it, a, a big band orchestra came and, and hundreds of people showed up to this shop when she opened the shop. So I just want to show y'all what happens um, if we don't speak up and speak out and know what's going on uh, in our horticulture world here in our neighborhood. Now, the next place we're going to head on to is to Monticello, to Virginia. And this is a gentleman named Wormley Hughes. He is the head gardener at Monticello on Thomas Jefferson's estate. He is uh, born there, and he also is believed to have studied the horticulture work under a gentleman named Robert Bailey, who's a Scotsman, who worked closely with Thomas Jefferson. So what exactly did Wormley Hughes do in Monticello? Well, he did a heck of a lot. This is a man that felled the trees. He helped plant the famous uh, oval flower beds at Monticello. He laid out the vegetable gardens there, and he even dug Thomas Jefferson's grave. And uh, Thomas Jefferson's daughter, Ellen, was said to, or actually she, it wasn't said, she wrote this down. She said that Wormley, she described him as always being armed with a spade and a hoe. And so this is a gentleman who is so much more than just an enslaved person. This is a highly skilled horticultural professional. That's really the way that we should be describing him in history moving forward, not to erase the horrors of being enslaved, but to be very real about what his talents were at Monticello. I've certainly worked on an estate and been an estate gardener, and I can tell you you're doing a, a lot, a lot of work there. So Wormley Hughes is someone I consider the godfather of all of ornamental horticulture um, for America. Now we're going to head on out to Iowa, Iowa, um, the state of Iowa. And this is Sioux City, Iowa's finest. This is a gentleman named Malcolm Jerome Stubblefield. Um, his family migrates to Iowa from Tennessee. So he's born there. His parents are from the South. And he is the first black man to graduate from his high school in Sioux City, Iowa. And he also goes on to Iowa State to earn his agriculture certificate, which we now would call the horticulture program there. And sometime um, after his graduation, a few years, he makes his way out to New York City. And in the mid 1930s, between around 1935, 1938, the person that is responsible for the beautiful appearance of the New York Botanical Garden is this gentleman, Malcolm Jerome Stubblefield. He also goes on to work for the New York City Parks Department and eventually makes his way down to Washington, D.C. and just becomes an entrepreneur and runs his own businesses. And his father was also someone who deeply loved flowers. He was a postmaster there in Sioux City. And that is how I believe Malcolm Stubblefield probably got his love for horticulture from working in the garden with his own father. Now we're going to head on down, I guess, back back east to North Carolina, to Asheville, North Carolina. And this gentleman that you see here, this is the Azalea King, the Azalea King named Sylvester Owens. And he is the head gardener at the Biltmore Estate. He becomes head gardener when Chauncey Beadle, the legendary Canadian horticulturist, passes away. And Sylvester Owens starts his career out as a chauffeur. For Chauncey Beadle. And he is also accompanying 
Mr. Beale on these plant hunter trips throughout the South, and they are studying native plants. They're collecting them. They're propagating them. They are definitely um, studying azaleas. And this is when around the time that uh, Sylvester Owens also becomes the landscape assistant to Chauncey Beadle. And when Beadle dies, he is handpicked to take over the legacy of Biltmore Estate and Gardens. He goes on to teach classes all over North Carolina, teach um, people who come to the garden and want to learn about azaleas. And under his reign, he was determined to make it the azalea capital of the world. So this fine gentleman here, Mr. Sylvester Owen, and I do want to speak a little bit uh, to colorism here on this slide before I go. Uh, Sylvester Owen um, even has said himself that he was able to uh, likely drive around with Mr. Beetle because he's so fair skinned, white passing black gentleman. And this is a gentleman, even when he checked into the hotel rooms, he would have to ask for the black rooms because people didn't even realize that. And he lived his life as a black man, but colorism does come into play. And we'll show it one more time um, where it comes into play, not to the person's benefit as it, did, as it did in the case of Sylvester Owen, but probably to the non-benefit of their legacy. But I think that we can all change that. Now, I want to talk about how horticulture, uh, agriculture, gardening, plants, arboriculture is so expansive. And it's not just the people who are outside physically doing the work, it's also literature and art. And the woman that you see here is a woman named Effie Lee Newsom. She is a writer, a Harlem Renaissance writer, a librarian, a teacher, and she writes for the Crisis Magazine, which is the official magazine of the NAACP. And the editor is a gentleman, a famous gentleman we all know, named W.E.B. Du Bois. And she specifically writes for the children's pages of this magazine as she is a children's librarian. Now, one of the things that she does is write a lot of poetry. And she's writing this poetry to children, Black children, during the Jim Crow era in the United States. And this is one of her mo more famous poems. It's uh, called The Bronze Legacy. And I just highlighted a few words here, but what she is doing here is that she is using nature to describe the hues of nature, the browns, the bronzes, the gold, these beautiful bold colors, and describing it to the skin of these black children and letting them know we're in the Jim Crow era, times are tough, and regardless of what people say and think about you, you are beautiful. It is a noble gift to be brown. You're brown like the land, even like the trunks of trees, even oaks to be like these. That is who you are. That is how big and bold and strong and proud you are. And she ends the poem by saying that she thanks God or to the child, I thank God I am brown for brown has mighty things to do. And this is a very, um, it, it's an incredible way that she talks to children because it also allows children who aren't black to read these poems and see the beauty in other uh, black children. Now, she doesn't just write for the magazine. She also goes on to put together a book, a collection of poetry, uh, nature poetry. So Effie Lee Newsom is also what we call an eco-poet, uh, an environmental poet. She's a naturalist. She's an artist. She does her own art. And the book that she writes is called Gladiola Garden. And again, she takes the gladiolas and same thing. She shows the varying hues of gladiolas and compares them to the many tints of black and brown children. And even notice the cover of the book, you see these beautiful brown children hu hugging these oversized uh, perennials, these gladiolas in the garden. And I want to point out that the woman who does the artistic work for that book is a woman named Lois Milu Jones. Lois Milu Jones goes on to launch the art department at Howard University, the HBCU, Historically Black College and University in Washington, D.C. This is a woman born in Massachusetts, and she studies at the art school up there. She goes to study in Paris. She marries a gentleman from Haiti, also an artist, is influenced by art over the world. And inside of the pages of Gladiola Garden, you'll see images like this. So during a time where black skin, dark skin is used as a caricature, the exaggerated lips, the exaggerated nose, she takes that fullness and applies it in a way of beauty and shows that even these beautiful dark skinned black children are indeed beautiful and they can enjoy the beauty of nature as well. So it is a, a book with not just poems around gladiolas, but the seasons, the weather, the vegetables. It's just a really amazing, I consider it a work of art. 
and artists. So you know what? I got to do a shout out right now to my favorite extension agent if she is on this call today in the state of Florida. And that is Julie Bowen McConnell, my classmate from Auburn University Horticulture. And she does a lot of work with entomology. So Julie, this is for you. This is the iconic William Charles Costello, the entomological artist for Ohio State University. And during the 1940s, this is during the World War II era, uh, the WPA, the Work Progress Association or Administration, Work Progress Administration is having um, an event. And Mr. Costello's artwork, his artwork is up at what is essentially a boys and girls club in Columbus. And one of the Ohio State University professors sees his work and invites him to become an entomological artist for the entomology department there. And he also does zo zoology art. So what does an entomological artist do? Well, he is the person that looks in the microscope and draws these detailed drawings of the insects um, by hand. And this is some of his work. The, the picture that you see on the right, his knee sent to me. This man drew tens of thousands of entomological charts. And this is one of the charts that he drew at Ohio State. And when he was asked about his work, why is entomology even important to look at these bug pictures, which we know they're called insects. And Mr. Costello replies that it's just like the war, the same way that the soldiers are taught to look at enemy planes versus friendly fire. That is the way I teach people to look at insects, whether it is a beneficial or non-beneficial insect. So who knew? Yes, we can all uh, expand our thinking on what careers in horticulture can be. And that's just my alarm. Let me know. It's 1030. I got about 15 more minutes. So we're doing pretty good on time. And I'm going to go to the next slide. And while I do that, I'm going to cut this off. So we're headed from Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. We're going to head up to Harlem. We've been there a little bit earlier today with Effie Lee Newsom, the Harlem Renaissance writer. And really, she spent most of her time in Ohio and also Alabama. But this beautiful, lovely person that you see here, this is Lucille Kane from Lucille's House of Flowers. Now, she was the only Black florist um, artist at the Metropolitan uh, Floral Association event in the 1940s. And she wins a prize for most originality for creating this beautiful hat 300 orchids and 15 baby orchids at the top. And I love this hat because it just shows, again, that just the artistry that can be done with plants. And we're going to see a little bit of this artistry again, not from her, but from other people. So Lucille Kane in Harlem marries into the floral business, but then goes on to make it her own and just her use of creativity, her liveliness, her glow. She is, she's everything, y'all. She is everything. So we're gonna stay in Harlem. And there's a reason for that. In the early 1900s, when, when black performers wanted to get on and make it um, to Broadway, to Hollywood, they would be outside of the Lafayette Theater in Harlem or maybe Lafayette, but roll with me y'all, one of the ways to say it, Lafayette, La Lafayette. And they would gather out there. You can see the big crowd outside of this theater. And specifically, they would gather under a tree. And they called this tree the Tree of Hope because they hoped that they would get picked for performances. And the tree was believed to have special powers and brought people good luck. They would pull off the leaves. They would touch the bark. We know we're not supposed to treat our plants like that. But again, this was a very, very special tree. And people were just putting it all on the line, doing their performances, hoping that this was their day. But the city of New York comes along and cuts this tree down and says, you know what? The tree is past its prime. We're cutting it down. And the people in Harlem are devastated. This tree is iconic. And the picture you see on the right are the little boys gathered around this tree. Now, a gentleman named Ralph Cooper. It's kind of funny. They call him Dark Gables instead of Clark Gable because he's this suave black man. Uh, takes a piece of this tree once it's been cut up and says, I'm going to take a piece of this tree trunk and I am going to have someone mounted stage right. Maybe it's stage left. I can't remember because I'm not a performer. And this is the tree trunk that you see today. If you've ever seen in a TV performance um, uh, of the Apollo Theater, this is the tree trunk that you see, the tree of hope. So not just a people can be legends in horticulture. It can also be the plants. And any performer that takes that uh, stage of the Apollo is uh, what you do is that you rub the trunk of that tree 
for good luck because it has brought good luck to so many people like James Brown, like Gladys Knight, like Beyonce herself, all these people who came before and performed at the Apollo Theater. Now we're going to uh, take the train on down from New York to D.C. And these are the floral vendors. This is 1870s Washington, D.C. These are the black women who came in from Virginia on horse and buggy, brought their plants in to sell in front of the Potomac River. This is a mobile nursery, y'all. You can see the potted plants there. You can see the cut flowers they have there. You can see the community that they have built around each other there. And this is only just a short five years after slavery has ended officially in the United States of America. And you can see that these women are self-employed, independent, and are the reason that people come into downtown DC to purchase these flowers is to come and see them because they have the best product and the most beautiful plants available. Now, a little bit north of DC, or maybe it's northeast Baltimore, and this gentleman that you see here is a grainy little picture, but it's a great story. This is 1920, and this is a gentleman named Thomas Queen. He is born into slavery in the uh, state of Maryland, and he one day he uh, sees someone throw some geraniums in an ash can, and he decides to bring those geraniums back to life. And it's from that day forward, he is committed to horticulture and decides this is the career I want to pursue. He ends up being a, a, an estate gardener at the state house, which is the governor's mansion essentially in Maryland. And this is a picture of him in his greenhouse where he sells and ships flowers from Baltimore to Annapolis at the age of 86 years old. So that's why I want to highlight him. It is never too late to start your amazing nursery. Now, I'm not saying he started at 86, but he's certainly still working there at 86. So we can all live our dreams. We can all live the fabulous life that Thomas Queen did as well up there in Maryland. Now, I want to talk, I love trees, I, I absolutely do, and this gentleman, we're up in Pennsylvania now, and um, specifically, um, this gentleman, let me just give you a little backstory. he's born uh, in Wilmington, Delaware, goes to school there, and when he goes to college, he goes to what is the Pennsylvania Forestry Academy, which is now known as Penn State Mount Alto. He is one of 13 students in his class, and only six make it out. And this gentleman is named Ralph Elwood Brock. He is the first black forester in the United States of America. And he runs the tree nursery there at Penn State Mount Alto for a few years. There's a plaque there today telling his story. And he also goes on to own his own nursery, run his own landscape company, and stays in the horticulture uh, gardening business throughout the rest of his life. And this is, now this is his picture from when he's pretty much a freshman in college. So he didn't look this young his whole life, but this is a great picture of him when he first starts out his career in horticulture. So Titusville, Florida, if y'all are in the building, y'all also represent, I think that's Brevard County. And many of y'all know this gentleman's face, but you, you, I can't, I, I told someone the other day, you know, I wouldn't go to Texas and not mention Beyonce. So I'm not going to come to Florida and not mention the iconic William Henry Maxwell, born into the state of Georgia. Uh, he's a toddler when slavery ends. And in 1894, and, and, and in between this time, he moves down to Florida, to the great state of Florida. He purchases a small grove and begins to cultivate oranges. And by 1936, Mr. Maxwell owns 30 acres. And it is said that he, is, uh, he controlled over 200 acres in his lifetime. His uh, financial worth of all of his orange and citrus groves was $250,000, and if we equate that to the spending power of what we had then of today, that is $5 million in purchasing power that Mr. William Henry Maxwell, self-made orange citrus millionaire, ten all close to 10 figures, he's at five, uh, does down in Brevard County. We had to come back to Florida to get warm, y'all. It was getting a little chilly up north. Okay, so... I also uh, want to stay in Florida briefly. This is in Leesburg, Florida, which I believe is Lake County. Um, and we're going to talk briefly about garden clubs. Now, garden clubs were mentioned, black garden clubs uh, were mentioned in the state of Florida as early as the 1920s. And this is a woman who wins first place prize for the best Christmas tree in Leesburg, Florida um, with her, her black garden club. And this is around, I think, the 1940s, 50s. 
However, there's also garden clubs and these women aren't doing just frivolous beautification work. They are also civically and actively engaged and they're all over the country. These women are in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is a town and country garden club. And the lady that you see to the left is a woman named Mrs. William Roberson. She is looking at her plaque with the lady on the right um, with the hat on. Her name is Mrs. Artie Halyard. I'm talking about the green picture. And Mrs. William Roberson has won 11 ribbons at the Wisconsin State Fair. That is a big old deal to win 11 ri ribbons for your plants and your horticultural specimens at the Wisconsin State Fair. And this is the type of work these garden club women were doing. The woman on the right in the purple is just a visitor to one of their shows, but it is intense, y'all. Look at how intensely she's looking at these plants. So it's a big deal. But the most famous garden clubs of them all is in the state of Virginia. And no, this background is not Virginia, but it's a road trip, y'all. It's imaginary. It's fun. We're just going to roll with it, okay? So this is Mr. Asa Sims. He is a student at Hampton University, goes there to be an artist, but ends up taking a job in the greenhouse as part of his work study program. And he realizes, I don't have to paint my pictures. I can plant them with flowers. And he goes on to do beautification and horticultural work, teaching classes throughout the states of Virginia and North Carolina. Now, Asa Sims, this is him. I pointed the arrow to his head. This is him with one of his classes. Asa Sims didn't believe in PowerPoint, y'all. He was gonna bring you a 3D model to your face. And this is him sitting down at his um, table here, and he has brought a 3D model of what a balanced landscape will look like with the house and the shrubs. And if you zoom in, you can really see that, and you can see how attentive his classrooms are. He is taking this work out into the community, and he partners with people. Specifically, the woman that you see in the middle, this is Ethel Early Clark. She is the first president of what is called back then the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. It is launched in 1932, and they have three goals there. And what they want to do is stimulate interest in gardens. They want to disseminate this information about beautification. And they also want to encourage beautification work throughout the state of Virginia. And they're also organizers, y'all. These women are getting people registered to vote in the state of Virginia. They're demanding that the city come fix their potholes. They are really, they're doing the Lord's work, y'all. They really, really are. And this gentleman is a colleague of Asa Sims. His name is Dr. H. Hamilton Williams, also a graduate of Hampton, goes down to teach at North Carolina A&T, so we're still in Virginia. He goes to North Carolina briefly, then goes to New York and earns his PhD from Cordell University. And he is the first uh, person, uh, first academic to study black landscapes in detail and writes about them. And though he is critical, his observations are very, very acute. And he talks about how there's hardly any black landscapes without tires edging the borders of the flower beds, without herbs growing in tin cans. And he also, with Asa Sims, he is the editor. H. Hamilton Williams is the, ed Dr. H. Hamilton Williams is the editor of the Handbook of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. This is passed out on their 10th anniversary in 1942. So they started out with seven clubs with Ethel Early Clark as president. And in 10 years, they have close to 100. And then years after that, there are thousands of clubs of black women all over America. And some of which you saw today down in Florida, up in uh, Wisconsin, and of course, throughout Virginia. April 22nd, 2022, Earth Day of next year is the 90th anniversary of these women's forming their club. So we have to remember to acknowledge them and think of them on that day. Now, I'm going to bring it on home. I got about five minutes left, so I'm going to try to be super quick. The gentleman that you see on the left is a gentleman named William Lanier Hunt. Some of y'all know him as Bill Hunt, the North Carolinian uh, horticulturist extraordinaire. And Bill Hunt is uh, specifically a, a white gentleman. He's the only one in the slideshow today. But he says something quite interesting. He, he gives a lecture on this about how it was the formerly enslaved people after the Civil War that went back into the antebellum homes and saved all these antebellum and heirloom plants that we know and love today because the properties had been abandoned after the war. And he, in my mind, was referencing people like the ones that you see here at Magnolia Gardens and Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. A little bit warmer down here in Charleston or up uh, across in Charleston for me from Atlanta. And we talked about colorism earlier. And I think about people like this woman named Aunt Phoebe. And I say ain't in air quotes because this is a woman, an older black woman who is 
enslaved at the property at one point and is now considered a tour guide there. The war is over, but the Drayton family that owns the property brings back people like uh, Aunt Phoebe, in air quotes, to maintain the land because they're the ones that laid it out in the first place. And so she's pointing out the azalea. She's pointing out the Carolina jessamine. She's pointing out the iris. And this is not the work of a tour guide, y'all. This is the work of a plants woman. But sometimes it's hard for people to look back in history and look at this woman as an expert plants woman. Why? A few reasons why. Because she's dark skinned. Because she's wearing the mammy attire. That was a popular attire people would have their servants dress in in the early 1900s, their black servants. And so these reasons like this, we have to look at how colorism and the uniform that you wear can come into play when people are thinking about how valid your horticultural knowledge is. And I can tell you, I was able to go to Auburn and earn my horticulture degree because of the privilege of my parents having the financial ability to do that. I'm certain Miss Phoebe here can run circles around my horticultural knowledge. So she is the true subject matter expert, not me. Now we're gonna stay in South Carolina. And I said five minutes, but give me five more. I promise you we're almost to the end. And this is a woman named Mrs. Annie May Van Reed. Now, Aunt Mrs. Annie May Van Reed, unlike Aunt Phoebe in air quotes, she puts it on her sign. You can see in the background, it's a little glowy, Mrs. Annie M. Reed Flores. And she owns a five acre nursery and greenhouse in Darlington, South Carolina, which is a little north of Bishopville, uh, South Carolina, made famous by Pearl Fryer. Now, this is some of Mrs. Reed stationary. This is a woman who is since 1924 was sending plants from Darlington all up and down the East Coast, all the way north to places like Boston. She speaks to young black women, encourages them to open up their own businesses. She acknowledges that even if you're a woman that is uh, doing um, homework, stay, a stay-at-home mom, a, a job like that is still an essential job and just to do it to the best of your ability that you can. Now, Mrs. Annie May Van Reed said, Blanche King Hurston, yeah, you might've had that chauffeur, but I have me a 1940 Ford, Ford Floral Delivery and Greenhouse Van. And yes, she is here posing, giving it to us, letting us know what a boss that she is up there in South Carolina running this nursery and uh, essentially, she's also what would be in today's money, a self-made millionaire. Briefly, I want to speak about Tuskegee University. There were women there, like um, these young women that you see here, uh, doing work at the campus, doing beautification and floriculture work. And the person that encouraged this work was the woman that you see in the corner. This is Mrs. Margaret Murray Washington, the third wife of Booker T. Washington. And she is someone who uh, is teaching this curriculum to them. And it is based on a curriculum that Booker T. Washington observed when he saw women students um, learning landscape and beautification work at a school called Swanley College in England in the early 1900s. And this is a time it's not popular for any woman, let alone black woman to be outside doing this level of work. But these are the, the people that do the beautification and the installation of plants to install around Tuskegee University, the HBCU, right down the road from Auburn in Alabama. And Tuskegee also produces people like David August Willison, who is the first black landscape architect. He's a graduate of Cornell. Liberty High Bailey is his professor, and he goes on to lay out the Tuskegee campus. He lays out Fisk University, part of Florida, A&M University, and also part of Howard University in Washington, D.C. He's a landscape architect and works well into his 90s in that trade. Now, we are ending our road trip. We are going to bring it back home. Dade County, I didn't forget about you down there in Miami, because I know people think, at least people in Georgia think, the South ends at Jacksonville. We think Orlando and everything else is like, Florida. It's Southern geography, but maybe not Southern Southern. But this gentleman here, Mr. William O'Perry, he is a florist in Miami, Florida, Bahamian American of Bahamian descent and is incredibly successful and wants to get his plants shipped across the United States, his floral um, bouquets. And he has a problem. The floral telegraphic delivery service will not let him in. He, they will not accept black florists to ship their plants let alone their floral bouquets through this service, through the, the wire service. They just jump the black people when their name comes up. So what does Mr. William O. Perry, I believe in espionage like James Bond do? What he does is that he dresses up as a waiter and goes to the FTD convention and takes all the notes that he needs to take and comes back and 
forms his own organization and he calls it the International Florist Association. And this is Mr. Perry working in his shop and this is him working at his table, plotting, strategizing, making sure that he and other black forests are able to form. He forms this in 1953 to get their plants and their flowers and their goods across the United States. And he says, FTD, I don't need you. I got it. I went in there and spied on you. I got my notes here. Let's do it. And he does it. So the very first convention is held in Miami, Florida, as I mentioned in 1953. Now I wanted to show you this quick floral art. This is by a woman named Teresa Hubert, who is a black florist there. And the woman that you see modeling it is a shake dancer named Gloria Labami Howard. And this is at the Mary Elizabeth Hotel in Miami, no longer there, but a famed black hotel there. So again, showing off the floral art, they didn't just have a convention like y'all, they also had fun events like this fashion show. And they also talked business and they also talked civil rights. And they also talked about how to be the best plant people and floors there were in the world. And these are floors from many states coming down to Miami for this first convention. Now, the fourth convention is happening uh, in um, Cleveland in 1956. And before I say that, I just wanted to show you in this top left corner, this is a gathering of some of the people uh, Mr. William O. Perry is on the far left front row. And these women that you see, many of them names I know, but they are all women who went on and men who went on to just be uh, wildly successful in their hometowns. And this is Mr. O. Perry getting an award from the Carnation Growers Association. And as you see the headlines in the paper, they're not just, it's not all about flowers of them. They're actually doing work to combat prejudice in the United States of America. And at that 1956 convention, so we've left Miami, gone back to Cleveland, Mr. Perry is still in charge, Florida finest, and they decide that they want to give a woman her flowers. She is the mother. She is the one that is top tier at this convention. She is the one that everyone kisses her ring. They all show her respect. And this is Bessie Weaver, the first black florist west of the Mississippi on the left. Is 1956. She's looking like old money, y'all. 40 years into the game, the early 1900s. That is Bessie Weaver in her um, early 20s doing the floral work. So we've reached our stop. Our road trip is over. What a ride. Thank y'all so much for joining me today. I hope that you had as much fun as I did. And if you know a story I should tell, this is how you can reach me. My name is Averly. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, Walter Reeves, the Georgia Gardener, for referring me to Wendy. I know he's not here today. And also thank you to Emily uh, Eubanks for getting me through this, this Microsoft Teams, y'all. It was making me nervous. And of course, sending my big, big love to Julie Bowen McConnell, my Auburn classmate. So I appreciate y'all and I wish y'all a very wonderful day. Wendy, I want to make sure I don't do something weird here. So walk me through it so I don't um, mess it up. Um, Hit the you X, have right? done just fine. Okay. There's no, no, no messing up to do. Well, um, you can leave this screen on. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions, but mostly rave reviews and everyone loving your presentation in the chat box. So thank you, Abra, for being with us and enlightening us and um, letting us know what we don't know which is really, I think, as curious horticulturalists, we're just so thrilled to get this information. Uh, Dan Anton uh, wanted to know if it would be possible to get a list of the people that you um, brought up today. And I suggested that perhaps this is gonna be in your upcoming book, uh, but I was, uh, or maybe it's on your website, I don't know. So how would you get a list of these people to us? It it is in my upcoming book, which I'm working on currently, writing my little fingers off. And um, the book won't be released until the spring of 2023. Um, but if there's some specific people, just let me know. I'm I'm happy to, to walk you through that. Uh, clearly, Florida has it going on. Those are just some of the people from Florida I picked out. But um, that you, not all of these people will be in the book, but certainly some of them will. That's for sure, Wendy. Okay, great. And uh, another question was how how did you even so some of these photos are so old and you know where did you even begin diving into these archives to get this information? I went I went to a lot of places. I mean, it I went to Harlem, New York. I went to um, some of the HBCUs. Um, 
the I didn't really I, I, I got to tell you, too, sometimes it was word of mouth. It was the elders that remembered some of these people in their hometowns that put me on the game. In the case of um, Annie Mae Van Reed, the Darlington Historical Society sent me a picture of some of their stationery. So a lot of it is just um, asking people and, and, and being curious. And um, with Blanche King Hurston, I was just talking to someone in Jacksonville and they casually mentioned it. And we weren't even talking about flowers or plants. So a word of mouth is a, is a huge part of it. You'd be surprised. Great. And, um, you know, I, I just was in Darlington uh, a month or two ago and I had no idea, you know, you have no idea of the history that is surrounding these places and these road signs. And maybe you see an old greenhouse or what used to be a nursery and you have, have no idea the expertise that was there. That's true. We really don't. And there's been so much, but it, it's been a lot that's been lost, but it's never too late. And so back to how do I get some of this stuff? It's not sitting in a museum and it's not necessarily in a book where it is. It's in your grandmama's trunk that passed away in 1980 and no one's dug it out yet. That's where these pictures and stories are. And we just have to to, to go back and find it. It's not gone. It's not too late. And we can um, unearth these. And if you think that y'all know someone that does, look, Conquer the Soil is a big old family, as y'all can see today. So if you think there's someone that I'm leaving out that you would love for me to know about, please shoot me an email. I would love to include them. Great. Um, someone did just mention uh, Washington Carver and then, of course, um, our first uh, extension agent, um, whose Thomas name? Thomas Monroe I, Campbell? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah so... so I did. I, you know, it's funny because when you and I were talking previously, I said, I'm going to take a few slides out. I took out Carver and Campbell only because I, I'm i a little selfish. I'm, I'm so hardcore ornamental horticulture because that's my background. I was like, I'm going to take out these a few stories, but they definitely uh, deserve their flowers. But there's only so much you can get through in an hour. So thank you. What wonderful stories about Campbell and Carver, for sure. Um, you, yes, for sure. And, you know, we... Um, really enjoyed the backdrops and the color and the and the effort that you put into making your slides so beautiful it was a real feast for the eyes and i think horticulturalists really love uh you know beauty and we love color so thank you so much for sharing all that um and i think you might be getting calls from other people around florida because they are very excited so, Abra, we just can't thank you enough for kicking us off and um, getting us started. And people are just thrilled. And we just thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you again. We'd love to have you featured as our next, uh, when the book comes out, as one of our book club books. We do a book club four times a year. So it would be terrific. Oh, I would love that. Thank you so much. And y'all, please email me. I saw one little message come through about Aunt Aggie's Boneyard. I, I couldn't read it all, but email me that type of stuff. Word of mouth. It is so, so helpful. So thank you. That was a comment someone sent to me, but it went away super quick. So that's thanks, actually Wendy. Emily. That's Emily's sister, if you oh, need okay. to know. And so it's Aunt Aggie's Boneyard Historic Old Garden of Lake City, Florida. Okay. So, thank you. All right. Okay. Bye. Um, we appreciate it. Um, you all, the next thing to do would be to return to your agenda and go to your next link, um, which is either going to be flowering plants, flower, uh, Florida's waters, or palms. So those are your next three choices. You can choose to go into whichever section you would like. So, um, and I will be checking in over there. And again, uh, Abra Lee, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Wendy. And if I hit leave, it's not going to shut down everybody, right? It's just. It's leave. just going to say goodbye to you. Okay. Wonderful. All right. All right. Bye, y'all. Take care. Bye. All right. Okay. So the question here was, uh, we have. Um, Yes, we were able to share the positive comments with Abra and she will be able to see a recording so she can know. Um, also, um, the your link should work for your next ses ses sessions. Sorry. Um, and um, if you need to actually read the link from the PDF and copy it and put it into your URL, your box up at the top, you may have to do that. 
Um, you have received the links in the um, emails that I sent you. Um, I sent you the conference agenda Monday, Tuesday, and this morning at 8.15. So check your emails from 8.15 this morning. You'll see one from my name. And um, yes, you do log out first. We log out of this and we log back into our next session. Okay. No need to log out, just push the leave button and then you join your next session from there. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, so head on over to your next session. They should be opening. If they're not already open, they should be there very soon.